All right, good morning. It's Saturday morning for me, and I'm going to be recording adolescence. A very exciting yet trying time, just like infancy and toddler. Uh, lots of stuff going on that we'll be discussing. You'll need your book. Uh, turn it to chapter 16, and you'll also need your clinical tip handout that I put about Tanner's uh, growth and development uh, developmental assessment as far as where they are at on the puberty. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. All right. I will post this with uh, six slides per page and then each slide with my notes as well so you can use uh, whichever one that you prefer. And again, you can print these in black and white. You do not have to print them in color to save your color. Adolescence. This is the period of transition between childhood and adulthood. This period is usually viewed as, the, as beginning with the gradual appearance of secondary sex characteristics. And remember, this is about age 11 or 12, and it ends with the cessation of body growth between the ages of 18 and 20. I would like you to think about this question. Is there a clear-cut way to confer adulthood in our culture? And the answer is no. Adolescence is a period of transition between childhood and adulthood, but yet we do not have a clear-cut way to say, hey, you're an adult today. If I was to ask each one of you, when did you, what made you think you were in adulthood? Everyone would have a different answer. Some, it's the day you graduated. Some, it's the day you became of legal age that you could drink. Some of you, it was when you got a piece of mail in the mailbox with your name on it where you could get a credit card. I mean, it's just different. Sometimes it's your driver's license. But there is a clear-cut uh, lack of um, adulthood in our cultures compared to some cultures that they actually have a transition ceremony going from childhood into adulthood. All right, puberty and adolescence. Puberty is the maturational, hormonal, and growth process that occurs when the reproduction organs begin to function and secondary sex characteristics develop. So in girls, it's marked by menarche, and in boys, nocturnal emissions. Uh, adolescence is the physiological, social, and maturational processes initiated then by the pubertal changes. There's three subphases that your book goes into. Early adolescence, 11 to 14. Middle adolescence, 15 to 17. And late adolescence, 18 uh, to 19. So adolescence, we also called our teenage years, and it can be anywhere from 13 to 19 when we're looking at it like that. Please realize there is a wide range of normal for an adolescent. A wide range of normal. Physical development. The rapid rate of physical growth during adolescence is second only to that of infancy. And most of that has to do with hormonal activity. Uh, physical distinction between the sexes is determined on the basis of distinguishing characteristics, primary sex characteristics, and secondary. When we're talking about primary sex characteristics, those are the external and internal organs that carry on reproductive function. So when you think of primary sex organs, you should think of ovaries, the uterus, the penis. Uh, when you think of secondary sex characteristics, those are changes that occur because of hormonal changes. But they play no direct part in reproduction. They play no direct part in reproduction. So voice alterations, the development of facial and pubic hair, fat deposits, and breast development. Now, your book says that breasts are part of primary uh, sex characteristics, but they do not actually carry on a reproductive function. So, breast development goes under secondary. Examples of secondary sex characteristics in the female would be pubic and uh, axillary hair, enlargement of the breast and areola, sebaceous glands, wider, deeper pelvis. For the male, pubic, axillary, facial, and chest hair, active sebaceous glands, and voice changes. And you'll see the voice changes in girls too, but not to the extent that you will in um, boys. Uh, on page 478 in your book, goes over the us usual sequence of maturational changes. And then it talks about the tanner stages as well. 
So make sure you look at box 16-2 because that's the usual sequence and maturational changes for boys and girls and know those. All right, alert, alert. Failure to, for the breast development by the age of 13 in girls or failure to increase testicular size by age 14 in boys should be referred for medical evaluation. There may be something going on uh, with the pituitary. All right, physical growth. The final 20% to 25% of linear growth is achieved during puberty, and most of this occurs in over a 24 to 36 month period, known as the growth spurt. In girls, they're gonna grow anywhere from two to eight inches. They're gonna gain anywhere from 15 to 55 pounds, and that's between that occurs between the ages of 9.5 and 14.5. In boys, they're going to grow 4 to 12 inches, and they're going to gain 15 to 66 pounds, and they can occur anywhere between the ages of 10 and a half to 16. So they start a little later and end a little later. Nutrition alert: There is a substantial increase in the need for minerals such as calcium, iron, and zinc, and we'll talk about each one of those later and why. Most adolescents need well over 200 calories a day to support just growth, just this, just to support this growth spurt. Some adolescent boys, particularly those who are more active in sports, may need nearly 3,000 calories a day. So when you feel like they're eating you out of house and home, they are. Sex differences in general growth and distribution patterns are apparent in skeletal growth, muscle mass, adipose tissue, and in the skin. Now there are six main differences, and we're going to talk about each one of those differences. The first one is skeletal growth differences, and this is a function of normal hormonal effects of puberty and are primarily evident in limb length. The earlier cessation of growth in girls is caused by the epithelial or the growth plate closure due to the effects of estrogen. That's why we get the wider hips. In boys, the prolonged growth period prior to puberty and less rapid epithelial closure contributes to the overall length. They get more of the shoulder width. As far as uh, hypertrophy of the mucosa, enlargement of the larynx and the vocal cords, these occur in boys and girls to produce voice changes. In girls, they're going to have slap, slightly deeper and fuller voices. But in boys, you're going to see very noticeable, deep, high tones in the middle of a sentence. Uh, the average length of the vocal cords is about 4 inches in boys, uh, 0.4 inches in boys compared to 0.17 inches in girls. So that's the difference. The average lengthening of the vocal cords is about 0.4 inches in boys and 0.17 inches in girls. Third thing is growth of lean body mass or muscle. This takes place steadily during adolescence. Uh, it's both quantitatively and qualitatively greater in males. And at age 12 and a half to 13 and a half, girls are going to have slightly larger muscles. So enjoy it while it lasts because from there on out, usually not unless you work at it. Growth of non-lean body mass fat we know increases and follows a less orderly pattern. Uh, that's filling out the contours of the body, the shape, particularly in your thighs, hips, and buttock area, and breast, some breast tissue. So we see that more in girls. Hormonal influences during puberty cause an acceleration in growth and maturation of the skin and structures. You need to know about these glands. The sebaceous glands are responsible for acne. The eccrine glands are sweat glands located everywhere. And the African glands are responsible for BO. So you're going to need to know those. Um, these glands secrete a thick substance as a result of emotional stimulation. Uh, when acted on by, by bacteria, they become highly odiferous. Okay, body hair now assumes characteristic distribution patterns and texture changes during puberty. It coarsens, hard, uh, darkens, and lengthens more, particularly at sites of secondary sex characteristics. So those are the six main things. Reproductive, the endocrine system. The events of puberty are caused by hormonal influences, we know. We've got the gonads, uh, of course, in the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus over it. So stimulation of the gonads has a dual function. Stimulation of the gonads have a dual function. Number one, 
Production and release of gametes, G-A-M-E-T-E-S. Production and release of gametes. That means the production of sperm in the male and maturation and release of ova in the female. Sperm in the male, ova in the female. Number two, secretion of sex-appropriate hormones. Secretion of sex-appropriate hormones. That would be estrogen and progesterone from the female and testosterone from the male. Estrogen is found in low quantities during childhood and it's secreted slowly until about age 11. In males, this gradual increase continues through maturation, so they even have estrogen just at lower levels. In females, the onset of estrogen production causes a pronounced increase that continues until about three years after the onset of menstruation. So it's just gradual in the males, goes down, but in the females, of course, it stays high. Uh, of course, with the androgens, these are secreted in small, gradual increasing amounts of age seven to nine, where there's more rapid increase in both sexes, but especially boys until about age 15. So that's what's responsible primarily for that rapid growth changes we see in boys. All right, as far as looking at reproductive functions in females, the initial indication of puberty in females, breast enlargement. That's the initial indication of puberty in females, breast enlargement. Menarche is the initial appearance of menstruation that occurs. This usually occurs between 10 and a half to 15. It varies with cultures. We know African Americans is a little younger, uh, usually about age nine, can range anywhere from seven to 11. It's related to body weight, about 106 pounds. So once you reach about 106 pounds, uh, be, be careful because men aren't on your, on your heels. And that's why we're seeing it earlier. We're seeing children reach 106 pounds a lot earlier. Ovulation usually occurs 12 to, 40, uh, 12 to 24 months after men arc. The average age is 12 years and... Um, four months, about 12 years and four months. It used to be 9.5, but the latest research actually says 12 years, four months. All right, you need to remember, I told you this earlier, when you're talking to uh, teenagers that have just started uh, their menstruation cycles, that they will be irregular for about the first year. The initial indication of puberty is testicular, testicular enlargement between 9.5 and 14 years of age. Uh, spermatogenesis, we know, is a continuous uh, process that's usually well established by 17 years of age. The overt clinical is signed as the beginning of nocturnal emissions of um, semi seminal fluid that usually uh, occurs between the ages of 12.5 to 16.5. 12.5 to 16.5. As far as looking at um, determination of sexual maturations, uh, Tanner's a Sexual Maturity Guide, the usual sequence of maturational changes that occur. If you look on in your book on pages uh, 479 through 480, goes over those, you'll feel like you're looking uh, at some dirty pictures, but you're really not. It's just Tanner's. Um, I also have posted an article for you on clinical tips, and it's trouble remembering the tanners. Here's help. Now, you can go by the pictures on 479 and 480, or you can go by this clinical tip page. I like the clinical tip page better. So if you'll get the clinical tip page out, we'll go over that. But remember, with girls, breast enlargement. With boys, testicular enlargement are the first signs you'll see. Okay? So... With, if you're looking at your clinical tip sheet, it says it's been around since 35 years that Tanner developed this. These are not meant to be offensive or vulgar in any way. It's just to help you remember it. With the male genital development, if you'll remember Tanner 1 is the first stage, prepubertal, there's no genital development, so there's nothing. So if you look over there on 2, 3, and 4, there's nothing for 1. So 1, nothing. 2, Two normal sized testicles develop, so you can make your smiley face. Now the twos, you put two little eyeballs and you number them two. That will help you remember two normal sized testicles. Tanner three, penis elongates. So draw you a long nose and put a three on it. 
Fourth, the penis increases in breadth. So there's your smiley face going across your nose. So now we have a smiley face with two, three, and four. There's no one, so we know it's zero. Nothing's going on. Two, there's two normal sized testicles. Three, there's an elongation, uh, and we're drawing a nose on our smiley face and labeling it three. And four is the breath increases, so that would be your um, smile. So there is your smiley face to help you remember tanners. In the female breast development, you begin, you have to spell out the word breast. And you put the BR together, the EA, the S, and the T. So for Tanner's 1, again, nothing. Tanner's 2 is the BR, breast lumps or breast buds occur. So BR is breast lumps or breast buds. Then your EA stands for elevation or enlargement of the areola. That would be a Tanner 3. And you just go EA, EL, or A, which is elevation of the areola. Uh, so that the breast and areola continue to grow as one mound. So they're just growing as one mound. Tanner 4 is S, separation of the breast tissue of the mounds of the areola becomes smaller on the top of the larger breast mound. So now we have a separation. Then Tanner 5 is T, total breast development. T, total breast development or adult size breast and completed breast growth. Pubic hair is the same for males and females, so you will be able to use the same scale. For Tanner 1, nothing. So draw you a triangle and nothing. So Tanner 1 was nothing all the way through. Tanner 2, think of little two, think of two little hairs. They're very fine with few if any curls. So just a few little hairs, fine, not, not hardly any curls. Tanner 3s, think of dark, curly, coarse hair that makes you think of curly threes. Makes you think of curly threes. Tanner 4, picture the triangle in the picture completely filled in in black. Tanner 5, imagine the Roman numeral 5 with the hair spreading laterally onto the medial aspects of the thigh. So now you have spread. Now you're in the, your hair is spread to the medial aspects of the thighs. So that's the difference and that's the easiest way for me that I've ever seen to remember Tanners. Again, if you want to memorize page 479 and 450 in your book, you're welcome to do that as well. It says the very same thing, just in pictorial. Cognitive development, they're in Piaget's fourth and final stage, which is the period of formal operations. Remember, Piaget had an operation. Now they can think beyond the present, or we hope they can. We hope they can reason. We hope they can interpret analogies and symbols, understand abstract concepts, philosophize. We hope that they can uh, able to see themselves as others see them, and we all know they're still legal, a little egocentric. According to Erickson, they're searching for their identity, identity versus role confusion or diffusion. And what is an identity? Of course, that's an inner sense of who yourself is in relation to the rest of the world. That's an inner sense of self in relation to the rest of the world. Now, Erickson thought you had to go through two stages to resolve this. First stage he thought you had to go through was group identity versus alienation. And at first, when you're a teenager, you belong to a group. Okay, you got to find a group. If not, you become alienated. Then you have to have personal identity versus role diffusion. Then you find yourself. Uh, once you belong to that group, that helps you find yourself. Much of adolescence is actually taking place in front of a mirror as you try to read from the reflection you're seeing, who am I? Uh, what do I look like to other people? You're actually scrutinizing the changes of your body contours. A bad hair day, a blemish can throw an adolescent into despair. Now what's very, very sad is the statistics. It's sad but true, but suicide is the third most common cause of death among adolescents. And the second is um, homicide suicide. So this is very, very, very disturbing. Uh, this is up 200% since the 1960s through 1990s. If you take all those stats during that time since 1990 to today, it has went up 200%. Moral development, they're in Kohlberg's post-conventional stage. Remember, Kohlberg went to a convention. Remember, now they're learning the moralities of society, what's right and what's wrong. They need support and encouragement during their periods of struggles. Emotional behavior. 
Oh, my word. Talks about this a lot on page 482 through 483. It talks about uh, relationships with parents and some of the things that they go through and how to communicate with adolescents effectively, the art of listening, which is very hard sometimes. So you need to read that uh, really good. It says, as teenagers assert their rights for grown-up privileges, they frequently create tension within the home. They resist control and conflicts can arise in almost any situation or any subject. Favorite topics of dispute include the use of uh, phones, internet, uh, manners, dress, chores, homework, disrespectful behavior, friendships, dating, money, automobiles, alcohol and other substances, and time schedules. Present in the areas of conflict are the overriding arguments that everyone else does it or, uh, or is allowed to be desired item or privilege. You don't understand me. You don't trust me. You always treat me like a baby. Spoken or unspoken parents' reactions consist of, is that all the thanks I get for all I've done for you? So it tells that there ends up being a communication barrier set up sometime. So page 483, read that uh, family-centered care, communicating with adolescents, the art of listening. Adolescents... Uh, facilitate between emotional states. Um, they're in and out. Uh, they can be moody, rebellious, rebellious, indifferent, and troubled. And part of that is just like the toddler. They're struggling for independence. One minute they can be ecstatically happy and the next sunk in the depths of depression. Um, these outbursts sometimes are unpredictable, uh, but they're easily, but they're essentially normal. And they appear uh, less as the teenager has uh, more control of some of who they think they are, their identity, as well as some of their instinctual drives. Interviewing adolescents, you want to ensure confidentiality, show them concern, offer a non-threatening explanation, maintain objectivity, begin with less sensitive issues, use language they understand, and restate what, they, what you think they have said to make sure you're on the same page. Uh, page 487 talks about nursing care guidelines, interviewing uh, adolescents. Uh, you want to make sure that you are uh, talking to them on terms they understand. It says clarify terms such as having sex, making out, because I learned that making out means French kissings in these day and times, and making out meant something else to me. So you want to make sure you're understanding the lingo of the day, okay? Uh, set aside some time if you're interviewing an adolescent in the hospital that you're going to ask them some questions alone. So it's mom and dad, I'm going to ask you some questions, then I'm going to ask you some questions alone, then I'll ask y'all some questions together. Interest in activities during early adolescence, the interest in activities of boys and girls are in contrast. Uh, they say that boys spend most of their time in active sports, which some girls do as well. Uh, where girls do that, but they're more social butterflies. They like the music, the makeup, the hairstyling, the clothing, getting together. Uh, both sexes like the movies, the concerts, dances, reading, computers, blogs. Now it's the tweeting, Instagram, uh, chat rooms, emails, webcams. Uh, there's so much stuff they've got nowadays that I didn't have. I can't even keep up with it. And we all know that each generation has its own characteristics. Uh, interpersonal relationships. Uh, to achieve full maturity, adolescents have to free themselves from family domination. The parent-child relationship changes to one of protection up to this point and dependency to one of mutual affection and equality, and that's very hard. Uh, the behavior is a struggle, again, for independence. So the central problem for both the parent and the child during this time is simply letting go. Major developmental characteristics of adolescents, you can read through here. One of the things I want to bring your attention to is this need for risk taking. It's a natural tendency for them to take risk and part of that is that nothing's going to happen to me, that feelings of indestructibility, I'm too young, people don't die at my age. So that they try things that normally they would not try. Peer relationships, um, they want support. Uh, this has the most potent effect on adolescent behavior. 
A lot of cliques, usually same sex, close friendships. Best friends develop a lot during this time. Um, and they're an audience that they can actually try on various roles and feel more comfortable doing that as they're searching for their identity. Relationships, dating activities, they go on group dates, 7th and 8th grade. Ninth grade, they're pairing off in couples. 10th grade, double dating. 11th grade, double dating. And 12th grade, single and double dating. Now, what I have seen is there has been a little laxadatial to this. To 11th grade, a lot of them are single dating now. And sometimes even in the 10th, unfortunately. But our pattern here overall for growth and development to, still continues to be in this at this time. Type and degree, the initial stage, we have our crushes, don't we? These are usually non-committal, extremely mobile, and it sets you up for uh, damage to your self-esteem at times. Let's say you sent that love note to your little sweet little uh, Johnny Smith. And, of course, it says on it when he opens it, Do you like me? Circle yes or no. I don't know if y'all remember doing that, but I did. And you're expecting two things. You're expecting a return note and yes to be circled. So if you either don't get the note back or no is circled, you start out getting crushed. Uh, steady dating provides a sense of belonging. Uh, so uh, it is uh, part of the normal process. Reasons adolescents engage in sexual relationships. Uh, if you look at your book, it says some of the, some of the reasons would be to satisfy their sexual drives. Uh, for pleasurable sensations, as a conquest, as an expression of some degree of affection, uh, to satisfy curiosity. Current trends towards greater permissiveness regarding adolescent sexual behavior will undoubtedly have an effect on the developmental experience of adolescents because then you will get into more STDs and potential teen pregnancies. Sexual education should consist of normal body functioning that's present in a very straightforward, honest manner. The relationship of ministration to the process of reproduction should be discussed. Many teenagers think that that safe sex for intercourse is midway between the menstrual cycles. Wrong. So they, if you're getting that from other teenagers, a lot of times they get wrong information, so it's better that they get the correct information. So, teaching it uh, from a different perspective would be from a biological, social, health, personal, interpersonal, and from a value belief system. Uh, about 47% of all high school students in the U.S. have had intercourse, and about 34% are currently sexually active. Only 63% said they used a condom during their last inter uh, sexual encounter, according to the recent study I read. Average age of intercourse is 17. Personal health, personal care. Uh, the teenager is very uh, receptive to discussion and counseling about personal care and hygiene, provided it's related in an appropriate manner. Uh, that means that you've got to make sure uh, things, if you want them to use deodorant and showering and shampooing and hair removal, it really comes better uh, if you do it in a professional manner. Boy, your hair would look so shiny and glossy when you keep it clean like that. Look how pretty that looks. Um, oh, you smell so good today. Boy, you keep those teeth pearly white like that. I mean, you've got to encourage a little bit. Immunizations for adolescents 11 to 18, they should receive the Tdap, which is the uh, tetanus, diphtheria, and acellular, which is the adult dose of uh, these because the younger dose, remember, you should worry about that, getting the DTP after age 7. So we switch it to the Tdap. The menginococcal vaccine is also 11 to 12 or at age 15, and then Gardasil if it hasn't been given earlier. And those were on your sheet, and you'll need to review those. Uh, TB skin tests can be given if they're in an at-risk population during this time. Um, parents often accompany, accompany teens uh, with a health care problem during an examination. Again, you want to provide an opportunity to see both the teen and the parent privately and then integrate the health promotion, health maintenance into one visit. Um, vision and hearing. Uh, regular testing is important. Uh, it increases, there's an increase in the school uh, to make adequate vision essential for success, so they are doing uh, more screenings. 
Um, you want to warn them about portable CD players uh, for extended periods of time and at real loud volumes they can result in permanent hearing loss, particular cochlear damage. The skin has uh, become the latest uh, has become one of the sources of parent adolescent conflicts, particularly piercing, tattooing, and sun tanning. Uh, caution about letting your friends, family, strangers pierce. You have to watch it because it has there is a need to be sanitary. There's been lots of infections and scars out there from letting people do it who weren't trained. Sun tanning, of course, long-term effects is hard to explain to a teenager who thinks nothing happens to them. So a lot of times showing them pictures of premature aging, skin cancer, educating them will help. But other than that, they're going to do it anyways. So teaching them and educating them to do it the proper way, not staying in there too long, using their goggles to prevent corneal brain, uh, burning. So making sure they're following uh, the rules that they should be if they're going to do it anyways. Nutrition uh, peaks, uh, girls 10 to 12, boys 12 to 14. So again, if you feel like they're eating you out of your house and home during this time, they are. Caloric and protein requirements are higher than at any other time of life, and it's tailored again to their activity level. There's a substantial need, we said early, for calcium, iron, and zinc. Calcium is because we need that for skeletal growth, and up to about 1,100 milligrams is needed. Iron for expansion of muscle mass and blood volume. Zinc for generation of both skeletal and bone tissue. Now, one vitamin a day will get them all the adequacy of those uh, minerals that they need. Eating habits can become problematic. Uh, we get a lot of our eating disorders during this time, so you want to watch them very carefully to make sure they're not skipping or over or under eating because uh, they are easily influenced by their peers. Nothing can make them eat wisely, again, but if it's associated with things with clearer skin, firmer flesh, glossier hair, more energy, they're more receptive to the education. You got to bribe them a little bit. Their best approach for their posture during this time is to show them, not tell them, by sometimes using a full-length mirror. Uh, it is normal for them to have a slouching posture because of the rapid skeletal growth and the lag in muscular growth predisposes them to slumping. So they really have to work not to be slumped. Sleep, it's not in their vocabulary except in the afternoon and weekends. There's an increased need for sleep during growth spurts. Six to eight weeks, six to eight hours during the week, 12 hours on the weekend, and recommended eight hours. So they tire easy, they stay up late, and they don't want to get up. Accidents, the leading cause of death is motor vehicle accidents. Why? Well, some of that's improper driving or poor judgment. And there's been a recent upsurge in the use of drug and alcohol while driving. But remember, they think nothing's going to happen to me. Improper driving or poor judgment, as, long, as well as uh, the recent upsurge in the use of drugs and alcohol. Uh, homicide, suicide, remember I said earlier, leading causes of death during this time. And then drowning in firearms. As far as firearms, most of the death occurs in the home or the, on the home premises on accidents. We have seen more school shootings. About half of the victims are between the ages of 15 and 24. Uh, most of your accidental injuries can be prevented from just simply taking safety precautions, and that's in the use and storage of firearms. Non-powdered firearms, air rifles, BB guns account for almost as many injuries as gunpowder. So what factors do you think have led to the increased number of school shootings? Uh, the biggest thing they have said is bullying. Uh, children who were bullied at one time uh, are uh, not taking that well, uh, and they end up having long-term effects because they feel like no one did anything. So tragically, we are seeing uh, a lot of school uh, shootings these days. All right, that's the end of this section. There's one more to go called uh, Childhood. Again, don't panic when you open that. There are 75 questions, but I'm not wanting you to spend hours and hours and hours looking those up. Some of those you can just look at and pretty much tell what they are. If you can't find it in the book exactly what you think it should say, then take your best guess. This is to get you going on this information, to look through this material. And as you're doing those questions, it will help you study for the test so that you can go back through those questions and use that as a guide to study. So really, it will help you in the end. 
Uh, one of the last things I want to say before I uh, get off here is talking about communication and how to enhance communication. Uh, we talked about, for example, I want to talk about the toddler. Uh, and I know we've already been over it, but think about a two and a half year old who's come to the clinic uh, and he's the child's being very uncooperative and rambunctious. And you notice that the mother's also obviously frustrated. So the nurse comes in and says, come on, Jake, sit up here quietly so I can hear your heartbeat. Nope. Of course, we knew that's what a toddler was going to say. And the mom says, Jake, listen to the nurse. Nope. Here says the nurse, if you promise to sit still, I'll let you play with my stethoscope. Okay. So Jack plays with the stethoscope. Mother. Jack, give it back. Nope. Nurse, there's some other children waiting to see me. I really need to listen to your heart now. Uh, the mother takes the stethoscope from Jack, and of course, Jack throws a fit. Mother, Jack, if you stop crying, I'll take you to get some ice cream on the way home. <laughs> okay. Sometimes we have such difficulty with him, the mother says to the nurse. Oh, those terrible twos. Can you see how that could have been handled better? Uh, for, for for one thing, that on the part of the nurse and um, the mother. Let's replay that. What if the nurse would have come in and said, Jack, I need to listen to your heart, so you have to be quiet. Would you rather sit here or on the chair? See, you've given them a choice, so you're doing that autonomy. The table. All right, Jack, let's jump up here. So Jack climbs up, jumps up there, and starts to fidget. Mom. Jack, sit still for the nurse. Nope. Nurse, if you would like, you can play for my play with my stethoscope while I hold it. You can only listen to your mom's heartbeat for just a little bit, and then I'm going to take it back. Okay. Nurse and Jack, you did so great. Now it's time to be quiet. So Jack turns around and listens, and he, uh, uh, Jack says, "Okay." How did you get him to listen at home? He never listens here. It can be so frustrating. The nurse, yes, that can be a frustrating period, but allowing him choices makes him feel like he has more of control. So that's just one example about enhancing communication, and I could go through each age group and do that and show you how to enhance communication. But I just want you to realize that as we're going through growth and development and we're learning about these theories and we're learning about what age group they're in, that it's very, very important that we do that because you will use that content, particularly uh, in the clinical setting when you're taking care of them. All right, best of luck on this test. Not as, enough, not as much information, so I hope you do really, really well. Thank you.